Welcome to The Suitcase. I'm the scribe with award-winning journalist Scott Burnside and former NHL goaltender Mike McKenna, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts and delivered by DoorDash. Hey everybody, Scott Burnside back for another edition of The Suitcase and The Scribe. Of course, Mike McKenna. I'm already wistful, Mike, that we're not sitting in the same room, that we're not taping cheek to jowl as we were in Vegas for uh, three or four days last week at All-Star. But uh, the wheel moves on. It never stops in hockey. And today, what a treat live from Beijing. My good pal, Steve Wino, the national hockey writer for the Associated Press. And I will also add the author of a soon-to-be-released book on emergency goalies, Steve Wino. So how are things? You're actually at a game in Beijing as we're taping. Yeah, I am at the Czechs in, in Denmark, and I don't know if this upset's going to hold by the time any of your listeners are listening to this, but yeah, it's, I, I am at the hockey arena. The men's tournament has started without NHL players, but yeah, it's, uh, it's wild to be here. I mean, we've, I've been here for, I think, nine days now. It uh, feels like I live in Beijing. <laughs> What's the mood and vibe like there, considering, you know, there's not NHL players, but everything else at the Olympics more or less is going along as is, as planned, with the exception of fans. Uh, right. It, it, does it have a weird feel to it, or is it, is it just oddly different? You know, I, I'd imagine once the play starts, you kind of forget that aspect. But is it is it weighing heavy on everybody's mind that's there? Yeah, it's surreal, because the, the weird part is, obviously, we're in this this bubble, and, and we go from the hotel to, to the arena or hotel to the media center, and we're in these buses, so we can see the entire city and people, like, living their lives around us and we can't get to them and then it's just this this very kind of weird environment and for the hockey I just think people care less about it than they would have if the NHL was here because you still got Michaela Schiffer in and you still got Sean White and everything going on around the Olympics and so the focus is on that when this tournament gets going we get to the to the quarterfinals the semis the gold medal game people were going to care about this but I'm telling you as much as I the U.S. and Canada scrimmaged the other day Mike and 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 it was fun to just sit there and just worry about hockey like all the other stuff all the other white noise was gone and it was u.s and canada playing hockey and it was a blast and what's weird about the games is it's really quiet in the rink because there are there are select fans there but they don't cheer really they just sit there and watch the game and and so it's like toronto i guess a little bit where all the corporate (laughs) fans are are, are there but but you've got people who are just sitting sitting there watching the game you don't even know if they know the sport of hockey and and so it makes for a very weird environment that some people are there but you don't have the noise it feels like those empty arena games in edmonton more than anything else now if there is a if there's someone next to you monitoring what you're doing blink twice really quickly but (laughs) we'll get you out of there man we'll get you out it's not (laughs) funny but i'm curious about uh, when you when you're interacting with journalists covering the games, is there a, a greater sense of trepidation? Are there concerns? And whether it's, you know, with the testing protocols and what might happen if if someone from the press board does test positive while they're there, or just in terms of your own sort of privacy and security. Like, it, I mean, you and I were both in Sochi, and that was the big story moving in. Was you know, are the Russians watching? Are they taping things? Are they? you know, are there listening devices in the room, all that kind of stuff. And honestly, I can't ever recall thinking about it once for a second after I got on the ground, but is that different? Is it different now than what you experienced, say, even in Sochi, which was eight years ago? It's more intense, actually, Scotty, than, than, than Sochi, because there's cameras on us at all times. And, and so, you know, you're being watched everywhere you go. There's monitors to take our temperature at basically like everywhere you walk, wherever you go. So there's just, there's constant monitoring uh, of, of all of those things. Um, but from, from a testing thing, I, I don't know how some other colleagues feel about it, but we've all been here for so long now, that this feels like the safest place in the world. I mean, like there, like there are so few positives and, and a few people got popped on, on landing for inconclusive tests. Some kind of colleagues who had COVID in the last month and came up with one of those kind of positives from the virus still being in and all that. But uh, knock on wood, like this, the bubble is, is working just like it did for the NHL. And so, and remember the NHL folks, and they're all like, let's just get to the bubble. If we can get to the bubble, we're going to be okay. And so to me, it feels like and we're not going to get this opened up like anything because this is China and they, and they want to just kind of get us out of here as quickly as possible. But it does feel like people can let their guards down a little bit more now because we've gotten through this without the virus getting in. And, and so 
it, it, it feels honestly safe. It feels like you have bubble wrap on you. So it sounds like we're in your, you're in your little plastic tunnels and we've got the wrap and we can do whatever we want. Be nice to get to that level. I, you know, I'm sitting here in America, especially in St. Louis, Missouri, right in the heartland. It feels to me like the women's tournament has a greater gravity to it than the men's right now. It does. I mean, I was very excited to watch Canada, U S women's hockey the other evening. And frankly, I really, and I hate this. It's like this. I just, I can't find myself getting excited or even caring about the men's tournament. Give me a reason why the men's tournament is compelling and a team or players that I should be watching or fans out there should be taking a look at while this is going on something to give them some energy about this tournament. Well, a it's, it's crazy because we have no idea what the hell's any good. I mean, it's, it's, it's so unpredictable that, that the Russians might be overrated. Uh, Canada might be pretty good. The U S might be really good. And, and, and I think, for, for American hockey fans, more than anything else, 15 college kids on this team. Jake Sanderson's coming after getting stuck in L.A. with, with some positives. This team is going to be fast, and it's going to be fun to watch. And the tournament's on NHL ice. This is not going to be Korea, where you've got these European teams able to slow it down and plotting hockey and all that garbage. This is NHL ice, and, and, and certainly with Canada being a big team and the U.S. being a fast team, it, it's going to be fun <laughs> hockey. But like, and, and you think of, of the Matty Beniers, the, the, the Brendan Brisson guys on, on the U.S. team, young players. Slovakia has got two kids that are going to be drafted in, in the top 10 or 15 picks this year. So there's a reason to watch them. Craig Ramsey is coaching Slovakia. You've got guys that, that, that people have heard of. David Krejci for the Czechs, Franz Nielsen right. for, for Denmark. Finland's going to be very good. I don't know about fun to watch, but Valtteri Filppula, uh, Leo Komarov, Sammy Vatanen, guys who played in the league and, and, and had decent careers. And, and, and it's the, the level of talent in this tournament, I think, is better than 2018. I, I can't tell you that it means as much as that women's tournament because women is a best on best, right? It's, it's the U.S., it's the best of the U.S., the best of Canada, and, and, and that's a real world championship. So it doesn't have that same feel. And I'm not trying to pretend like the men's tournament does. And it's probably maybe the eighth or ninth most important sport at the Olympics now because of this. And it would have been two or three with the NHL guys. But just the, the, the complete ridiculous unpredictability of this is what I'm interested in. And I'm, I'm paid to be here and, and, and write about this and, and all that. But the U.S. team is going to be fun. We have no idea what's going to happen. And to me, that's, that's the fun of sports. It, it strikes me, and I don't know whether, you, not to add any pressure to you, but <clears throat> because there are no NHL players, <clears throat> current NHL players there, and because it just all of it, it, it really, it, you're, you're the conduit, right? I mean, the time change sure. makes it difficult. It's you and your colleagues who are going to share the stories that will make us care about this tournament as it goes along. And I guess for the entire Olympics, of course, but, you know, because there's no sort of fan buzz, the fan buzz is created by you and the stories that you tell about the players. Um, and I wonder if, if that, what's that like in terms of a challenge and have you already found, are there, is there something like, I loved your David Quinn piece before you left talk, you know, telling a story about a guy who missed his opportunity to come to the Olympics as a player and now is coaching team USA at the Olympics. I mean, what a great, what a great symmetry to the whole David Quinn story. Have you already found something there that you can sort of hang your hat on? And it must, and like, I'm now I'm asking multiple questions, which you should never do, but it must be a little bit weird because my sense is the press corps is much smaller than obviously than if the NHL players were there. Yeah, and I have, and, and and not necessarily a certain story yet, Scott, but but more that if I don't see something or ask about something, the world doesn't know. Like USA yeah. Hockey never announced that Justin Applicator was here. If I didn't see it at practice and ask about it, no one would have any idea back home about this. And, and being basically the only reporter in a lot of these mix zones. I talked one-on-one -on -one with David Krejci the other day, one-on-one -on -one with Craig Ramsey the other day. It, it's it's, it's the, the access that you would dream of uh, as a reporter of being able to talk to these guys and being able to basically, you're, you're right, I, it's the conduit to, to the, the sports world back in North America because these scrimmages and these practices aren't getting broadcast. It's not like there's like there's 17 people tweeting out line combinations. It's just me. I'm, I'm watching every practice. I know the ins and outs of this U.S. team and a little bit of the, the Canadian team and, and everybody else around this tournament. So it's been fun to like tell the story about the Germans uh, defending a silver medal and kind of what German hockey has turned into now and 
Denmark in the Olympics the first time. And as games ha- start happening, we're going to start seeing kind of more stars of the Olympics. Like we knew Michaela Schiffer would be a star, or we knew certain Lindsay Jacob Ellis would be a star and, and, and Sean White. But the, the stars are yet to emerge here. Like we know an Eric Stahl, we know a David Krejci, but the, the, the stars of this Olympics have yet to kind of emerge to see who we're going to actually be caring about. Like we might be caring about uh, Brendan Brisson next week, or it might be Jake Sanderson, or it might be one of these other college kids who we drew Cabesto, the goalie. We don't know who the stars are yet. And I think that's one of the, the, the exciting parts of this is waiting to see kind of who the storylines of this tournament are, because it's not the natural Sid and, and, and Ovi. And, and we would love to see those guys here. Don't get me wrong, but it's trying to find some of those kind of diamond in the rough stories and really, one of the things I found this tournament is it's just old fashioned reporting, because even like the, the websites that list what time practice is going to be, it's all on a whiteboard at the arena. So if you're not here, you don't know who's skating when, who canceled practice, who moved practice. And if you're not watching practice and asking the questions, no one's announcing anything. So it, it, it's one of those boots on the ground. It's always like half the job is showing up. And in the Zoom world, you didn't have to show up. Now you really have to show up. And it's fun. So you're telling me that there's not a Google drive that they're updating every three seconds to make sure you're going to the right arena, who's on the ice, all that. I mean, I can't believe it. Like Scotty, this is a clear opportunity for us at daily face off to, to be able to get in on the line combination. So like, why don't we got to make sure we, we might need your help for this, for the website. Uh, I'm, I'm always curious about the, the human element of this and the food aspect is as simple of a, question as this may be, I'm, I'm just dying to know what it's like if, if you have a chance to actually have local flavors and cuisine and, and not just the normal Americanized stuff that you'd find everywhere. Do they try to cater to everybody in different ways within what you're able to eat while you're there? Yeah. And, and it's, it's hit or miss on the food. Like the hotel has a breakfast and it's, it's kind of a mix of, of Chinese foods and sort of American standards. Cause so there'd be like a thing of fries and a thing of rice, but also like an omelet and a fried egg. And there's this buttered ham that's actually very good. Uh, the, the, and so it's, that's a very consistent meal that you know you're going to get food. And then you kind of don't know where your meals are going to come from the rest of the day. And, and, and there's this the main press center area that has a, a robot makes a burger. Like there's a robot that makes burgers. You've got are, to tweet this out. If you can yeah, get that yeah. past the government, please tweet that out. I yeah, need yeah, to see no, that. The, the, yeah, the, 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 there's a robot that makes burgers. There's a robot that makes wontons. There's a robot that makes cocktails, which are weak as hell. Um, Do you know how hard it is to make wontons? That's a skilled robot, dude. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a well programmed robot. Uh, wow. So, but, so like the food, like you can find good food at the press center, and some of it is it's there was the other day it was chicken uh, onion. They look like onion rings, but they're actually chicken inside the inside the the ring. So oh like yeah, chicken, chicken rings. rings. That's a White Castle delicacy. Chicken rings. Yeah. So we, yeah. we found that we found that over here. We found, we found that over here. And there's like, there's a Peking duck <laughs> dish that was very good and, and, and hot uh, Peking duck and, 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 hot, and some hot pot rice and, and things that, yeah. And each hotel kind of has different restaurants. You're allowed to go to different hotels and eat the venues. I just ate an egg panini sandwich that was like, I don't know, $2 and 50 cents that it's fine. But it'll, it'll, it'll do for dinner. It, it's, it's been a weird hit and miss food because we can't go out of the bubble and just go to like an actual Chinese restaurant but there is good Chinese food and Western food to get here. You just got to find it. So my sources tell me <clears throat> that there is a plentiful supply of Sing Tao though, the uh, there, there popular is, Chinese. There beer. is, there, there is. And there are $3 and 15 cents us in the media center. The, the little green cans of it uh, finally had my first draft beer of the Olympics last night at, at the crown plaza, a, tw- a $13 Carlsberg. Um, but, but still, still good to have a, a, a draft beer after, after a little bit of time. Yeah. It's the, the, the congregating, I, ideally they wanted to keep it to a minimum, but you know, sports writers, when, when we get together, we drink, we tell stories. It's the fun of the job. As you, as you guys experienced in, in Las Vegas last weekend, we I'm are learning we're, this we're, rapidly. <laughs> we're, we're, we are having that experience here in Beijing, even if it's sanitized and, and places close a little bit earlier than, than we would like. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go, but I, be, well, I would be remiss if I did not ask you about your labor of love, your e-bug book. And I've seen you in action. We crossed paths a couple of times in Raleigh, actually, in recent months as you were putting, <clears throat> putting the finishing touches on your book. I've actually seen a mock-up of the cover. Um, t- tell us a bit about the book. You know, What's it called? When does it come out? And why, why did you go down the e-bug rabbit hole? 
It's called Odd Man In, Hockey's Emergency Goalies and the Wildest One Day Job in Sports. Uh, I, I just, it's a fascinating, it's, it's a tale of, of not just the e-bugs everybody knows about, the, the David Ayers, Scott Foster, uh, George Alves, the, the equipment manager mm-hmm. in Carolina, but just kind of all the stories along the way, the near misses, Chris Levesque, Levesque in, in Vancouver, who Johan Hepper gets run over and plays a game with a broken wrist or else he was going to go into a game. Yeah. And just all the wacky things that have happened over the years with e-bugs, because this doesn't happen in, in sports. Like Tom Brady gets injured. You're not going to bring in a division three quarterback who's, who's ready to play in this game. It doesn't happen. This is a, such a unique yeah. thing. So I did this story a few years ago for the AP and, and won a, an award for it. And I thought this might be more than that. This is, might be more than a story. There's so many stories to tell. I pitched the book idea, filed 70,000 words, and it'll be out next fall on on Triumph Publishing. And there's some absolutely unbelievable stories. I mean, I've spoken to to Scott Foster previously and just unbelievable what led to him ending up in the game. And even like during my career, some of, I mean, the things that happened because of e-bugs when I was involved in games, I had to fight a guy because he wanted out of the game so bad and he only had an e-bug. My only fight was because this Scott Tom Lawson guy went bananas in Vegas playing for the San Diego goals. And he decided I want out of the game. I've allowed five or six goals and I had to fight the guy. Man, we, I, could, I have endless ones of like near misses for me. We had in Vegas, our e-bug. I am not kidding. Was the Neil Diamond impersonator at the Riviera. That's unbelievable. the tribute act. His, we had to keep a hairdryer in the dressing room for Jay White. His hair is perfect. Looks just like Neil Diamond. He was our third goaltender. I can't wait to get a, get your hands on that book, man. That's going to be fun. Yeah, it's it's just, it's just a bunch of fun stories. I hope people enjoy it. Pal, <clears throat> I feel we've monopolized enough of your time while you're on the AP's dime in Beijing. You got a game going on. Um, I did. I, if, before I let you go, though, I wanted to circle back. I don't know if you were at the the, the women's game the I other was. night. I know there's I been a little. Um, oh, I assumed you were, but you know, there's. I I saw you know, a discussion about whether women's hockey belie- belonged at the Olympics, which is a bit of, it's, it's nonsense. But I, I'm curious about that Canada women's um, rivalry, of course, and with Canada winning the preliminary round game, I, are, are there, like, is there any sense within that group of a team that could knock one or the other off? I mean, I covered the, uh, some of the women's tournament in 06, U.S. were upset by Sweden, if memory serves correctly, in the uh, semifinals. Um, or is it, I, I mean, is everyone in the world waiting for Canada, U.S. gold medal, you know, part, whatever, six or seven? Or yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, no, 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 one, no one's beating either of these teams. There, there's, I don't think anyone gets within two or three goals of these, of these teams. It's just they're so dominant. They're on so such a higher plane of existence right now, mostly because they've been skating together and practicing together for so long that the continuity plus the talent disparity, they're just too good. And, and, and talking to a bunch of colleagues here who have watched this Canadian team play a lot, this might be the best, best Canadian women's team we've ever seen. They're like just top to bottom, everything about this team is dominant. And, and as good as the U.S. is, you lose a Brianna Decker to, to a broken ankle early in, in the, the opener. And, and that might be a loss that's enough to tip the balance toward Canada. Because even though the U.S. outshot Canada in that game, a lot of perimeter shots, a lot of, of kind of Canada being opportunistic and, and, and even lo- not even having Melody Dallas to, uh, in the lineup. This is a deep Canadian team. Uh, we can't wait for that gold medal game. I just, I, there's no way I can see it within the realm of, of anything reasonable that it's not going to be us Canada in the gold medal game. Yeah. And, and what a resounding, you know, a resounding way to ring in college hockey. I think, you know, every single woman in that game between the U S Canada played NCAA division one college hockey. And some of these teams are yeah. powerhouses, Minnesota's, Wisconsin's of the world, but that's really cool. And I mean, we've seen numbers grow even in the men's game. And of course it's near and dear to my heart. Cause I went to school, but right. you know, I've known a lot of these girls that have played at this level and these women and man, they absolutely train like crazy and are just as skilled. And that's, you know, what you see on display, even at the NHL skills competition, when they get a chance to go yeah. and you see, man, this is great hockey. I was so excited to watch the other night and I know we're all looking forward to seeing what's the eventual <laughs> repeat. Cause it's going to be the finals. We know that's going to happen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Between US it and Canada. It's a foregone. conclusion. So <clears throat> thanks so much for joining us. I mean, yeah. you're in, you're across the world in China. I, yeah. Sometimes I can't get over technology. It's so cool for you to be able to come in and spend some time with us this morning. That's right. Thanks very yeah. much for having thanks. me. 
Yeah, thanks again. And, and I just hope when it gets that gold medal game, you have as much fun as you and I had watching the women's gold medal game in Sochi, which was, it might be worthy of a it book was. even <laughs> in and of itself. My so. that, that, Anyways, that was like one of the great nights, yes. <laughs> stay safe. Thanks for doing this. Stay in touch. Talk to you soon. Mike, sometime when we are convened again, shoulder to shoulder, I will tell you about watching the women's gold medal game with Steve Wino and my pal Pierre Lebrun and a group of others uh, during the Sochi games, but it would take literally an hour to tell. It's a ridiculous story. <laughs> well, I look, anyway, I look forward to hearing it, man. That's Stephen was great. I mean, coming in all the way from China and, and, you know, like I, I even, I think back to what we just talked about there and, and, and I need to kind of get this off my chest because it happens a lot quickly. And I want to make sure it's clarified for people that at one point I said, girls and referring to women's hockey. And this is an old habit that goes back to us saying kids and guys all the time when we're talking about men's hockey and it just, it flowed out, you know, and that's, it's something that we do all the time that I get caught on with, even in media, people will be like, oh, why are you calling him a kid? He's a 24 year old guy. I'm like, it's just kind of what we do, man. Like when the guy, when your teammates are younger than you, you call them kid until they're like 30. So uh, it's just something that dawned on me that I wanted to kind of get off my chest, but like, I think it's such a unique perspective being in China, which is a very different government in the middle of COVID with really no fans in the building, but still this great international tournament taking place and the just sheer chaos factor of the men's tournament that's going to happen. It's pretty entertaining stuff. I'm sure from a writer's standpoint. Oh my God. Well, <clears throat> I've covered three and uh, in Italy, Vancouver and in Sochi, and it is, it's an incredible, it's an incredible grind when everyone's there and the NHL's there. And, and you know, as Steve alluded to it, like, it, like, I can't imagine, like, there's this, an enormous burden, you know, mm-hmm. ca- you know, sort of carrying the torch for the rest of the world, the hockey world, at least, because that's what right. he's covering. Um, there, it's a, it's a big burden. So he's, he's up yeah. to the task. So, well, um, and that's, that's what I love so much about what you do, Scott, like you're yeah. a fantastic storyteller and that, and that's really the true aspect of something like that. When he says old school journalism is to really be able to dig in and do the work and put your feet on the ground. And I, it's impressive, man. Like after wading into this side, knowing what you guys do to, to tell a story, I know I'm kind of, kind of giving you a big, big boost here, but dude, that's, it's a different. No, my enormous stuff. ego. It, it yeah, needs well, to be I, constantly fed. So. I did see how big your head is in person this past week in Vegas. So we'll, <laughs> it's not a we'll small keep, noggin. <laughs> we'll try to keep the air hose out of it. Anyway, I think there was hockey uh, last night. The last two nights. <laughs> oh my gosh! And once again, I mean, I, I love the NHL. Right? It never disappoints. <clears throat> you could uh, let's start with that Boston yes. uh, Pittsburgh game, please, because. You know, there's there are reports that comes out of uh, Fudo Shinzawa, my old colleague at the Athletic, writing that Tuka Rask's uh, comeback may, in fact, be over. That that yeah. he he's got hip discomfort, and it it just may not be happening for him. And Fudo's, um, he's uh, he's as good as they come. So if he says it, I believe there's a high probability of truth to it. Which is, you know, it's very sad. And then you have a, a game where the Bruins get up. Patrice Bergeron gets hit, a little knock, not, you know, a knock to the head. And, and I don't know that we've had any kind of update, but I saw certainly, you know, fears that it could be a concussion. And certainly he's back in the early days of his career, his Hall of Fame career, um, did suffer through serious concussions. And then the cherry on top of the cake, Brad Marchand, never failing to deliver for some reason, he's all over Tristan Jari last night. Stops him from flipping a puck to a Pittsburgh fan in Boston. And then sucker punches him while he's on his knees in his crease. And then tries to stick him in the face with his stick. So, uh, I don't know. You take your pick, uh, Mike. There's uh, Any one of those topics is worthy of a long discussion. But all three, it was a tumultuous evening for a Bruins team that ends up losing yeah, a game. Yeah. And uh, you know what? If it, This is an interesting part. There's we keep talking about it. top eight in the East. I, they're still locked in. I don't see how it happens, but listen, this Bruin team may be in a position where it's going to be difficult for them to get points moving forward, given some of the things we just talked about. What an absolute circus yesterday from top to bottom. At, and I was so here for it. I watched the highlights of that game like four times just for the fun of it. <laughs> and I, 
you know, it starts off like, let's, let's, I'll talk Rask first real quick. Yeah. If, if he's not feeling comfortable, which he really didn't look the last three or four starts that he had, he doesn't want to play and put that team in jeopardy. And that's what he said as much as like, I, I have to be good. I don't have time to figure this out. And that's kind of what I thought. I thought he had probably 10 or 12 games to do so. And it looks like he might be making that decision even earlier because at his age, it's not advanced, but you get into your thirties. And if you're starting to have hip discomfort after a major surgery like that, and you're already thinking, how many years do I have left? It doesn't feel like it's worth it, especially for somebody who is, he's a Bruin through and through, man. Like he doesn't want to make that team worse. And and I think that's the only fair and right thing to do in that instance is to step aside if you're not feeling that because, hey, Allmark, man, I think Allmark has done a really nice job in really the second the second quarter of the season since we're halfway there, let's say that. Once he kind of got acclimated and, you know, Swayman has been up and down and hasn't won as many games, but I, I think the Bruins are pretty stout in goal. I thought Rask would give them a bump, though, if he could go up to the top level. I really believe that. Um, and I, And it still may not be there, but or, uh, an injured Rask or an uncomfortable Rask isn't up to what Omar and Swayman have done this year. So, you know, simple as that. And if he had chooses to retire, what a career. I mean, I remember when he came into Providence to begin his professional career, you know, 20 years old. And I thought, boy, this, this guy's pretty good, but he doesn't have a pulse. And then by the second year, he's fighting guys and throwing sticks and shootouts and had all this fire and he never looked back at so um, really to me would be one of the, I think he's one of the best goalies, arguably the last, for sure the last decade, maybe the last two decades in the NHL and um, was a whipping boy at times in Pitts in Boston for not being named Tim Thomas, basically, which was tough on him. But, you know, the rest of that circus last night, I mean, I don't know what Jari said or if it just purely started from Marshant going behind the net and slashing the puck off of his stick and, He's going to give it to a fan, throw it over the glass, Jari is, and Marshawn goes behind the net, slashes a stick. Well, the puck pops up, and Marshawn just casually catches the thing. Like, it was the smoothest move, like, slash-catch combo. And then Jari's chasing him down, and Marshawn throws it at the ice guy, the puck. (laughs) I'm like, okay, he's upset. And then, you know, 30 seconds left, he's Obviously, Jari covers the puck and says something to Marshawn that he didn't appreciate. I don't know if Marshawn was simply defending the dignity of Boston or what he was doing, but he does. He suckers, he suckers Jari with a right, slashes him going off the ice. I loved it. It was great. And I bet you anything, if you, I mean, you, Tristan Jari said basically afterwards, oh, yep, yeah, things get heated, but we did everything we could to win. He knew he was under his skin and he didn't play into it all afterwards. He just let it slide. And that's going to eat at Marshawn even more. Um, I wonder what you think comes of this, Scott. I, I think Marshawn gets a fine for his actions. I don't think he gets suspended. Um, yeah. You know, the sucker it, punch I, and the slash at the end weren't great, but I, I don't see those really being suspendable offenses. Do you? Yeah. It may be the history that will factor into this. And I believe there was a match penalty called on the ice and, so it will be reviewed. And I'm with you. I mean, yes, he did sucker punch him, but it was not a, it's not the kind of play that it was, you know, if people, I'm sure that there are Penguins fans who are like intent to injure, give him six in person hearing trying to kill all him. those kinds of things. Uh, it was I, a I short jab, but <laughs> I, I would say just for being a dick, you should get two or three games, but I don't know. <laughs> You know, that's that's just me. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. I, I To me, the bigger issue is <clears throat> what happens to Patrice Bergeron yeah. who left the game. Uh, and Got kind of clipped know, by Crosby, of all people. You know, just Crosby was skating his normal route and they mixed up skates. Yeah. Yeah, no, and total, And you're right. I mean, I remember talking to Sidney Crosby, and it's a, it's a long time ago, but um, he, during his issues, because they've known each other, I mean – the ties between Bergeron and Crosby are long. I covered that, yeah. uh, that world juniors <clears throat> during the 04, 05 lockout and Bergeron who'd already played in the NHL, but was still of age came back and Crosby was on that team. It was Bergeron who took Crosby under his wing. Um, I know Crosby relied on him heavily during the concussion issues, just talking what, what this is happening to me. Did it happen to you? What did you do about this? Who did you see? 
Um, so their connection is long and strong. And I know in talking to Bergeron over the years, huge uh, respect for Sidney Crosby, of course. So mm-hmm. that, that it happens that way is, it's not ir- irony, but it's, yeah. it's curious. And that Bruins team, it's still, man, he's the engine. You know, I mean, Marshan is this, he's the skill and he's the, 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 the stir that drives everything around. But Bergeron is so important to that team. So hopefully it's not a long-term thing. You know, again, we talked about this when Ras came back. They're lucky that everyone else in the East is just kind of mediocre because they are a team right now, I think, that would be vulnerable, you know, to falling out if the race was closer. I still don't see anyone touching them for that uh, second wild card spot in the East. Do you? No, I don't. I, I think they're pretty safely in it, but they, man, they need pieces if they're going to contend. You know, I, I think they're yeah. still, they just miss David Krejci so much. That's a storyline even coming out of the Olympics. Would he consider coming back for a run with them? But um, at this stage of the game, and you've been out for a little while, how do you factor in as well? And I, you know, they're going to be looking to make moves. They need help. I think down the middle um, in defensively, they could add a piece as well, but they, Boston's just not quite there for me, you know, but I, I, it's funny though. We talk about how Crosby and Bergeron with their history and being friends and they end up colliding on the ice. Like I'm watching last night between Vegas and, uh, and Edmonton and almost the same type of thing. Mark Stone goes to swing behind the net. Cody Stacey stick comes up, hits him in the face, goes to the box for a high sticking penalty. Those dudes are like best buds. Like, like they've been in weddings together, man, like as groomsmen and he goes behind and high sticks of like hard by totally by accident. But yeah. isn't it funny when you see something like that happen? And obviously like, you don't ever hope for an injury or anything, but you just, here's two friends that one just inflicted serious pain on the other completely by accident. And, but you've covered this for a long time. I mean, can you ever remember there been animosity stemming from something like that it seems like more often than not it's you know kiss and make up basically the players just realize hey in this instance it just happened yeah no I think that's true I was thinking about earlier this year when Brady and Matthew Kachuk played and somebody (laughs) got a stick in the groinal oh it was Matthew it was big brother going after little brother right in the slot area in in more ways than one I guess (laughs) yes exactly so I think those are, you know, what again, it, it is a di- it's such a fascinating dynamic because, you know, the bonds, whether it's obviously with brother to brother, <clears throat> we've seen lots of those, you know, the Stahl brothers and uh, Nick and Marcus Foligno, Marcus Foligno involved in a pretty ugly incident with uh, Adam Lowry last night in the fight in another yeah. high, hotly contested game. Um, but it is an interesting dynamic how you can have those moments <clears throat> when the game's at its hottest and then separate yourself and come to family dinner or <clears throat> go to a wedding or whatever in the summer and laugh about it. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I like it. Yeah. I, it is. It's funny. Well, that, and that was, I tell you what, the golden Knights looked good last night. I mean, they handled so, Edmonton and, and that was Vegas got out to a lead and that was that. And McDavid didn't have a shot. I don't think credit until it felt like midway through the game, they played on top of them. They controlled it. And Vegas right now is pretty close to their full lineup. They're not, I mean, they're missing Martinez on the back end. Eichel is pending. And this is a big one here. I mean, he took practice, took a full practice, full contact. And, you know, we don't know exactly what the time frame is for full clearance for him to be able to go play a game. But if you're doing contact and practice, you're very close. And boy, that team looks pretty good. Laurent Brossois played very well in net. I'd expect Robin Leonard to be going um, this evening on Wednesday because it's a back-to-back scenario. He's in Calgary, yeah. but they're strong and they're going to get better with Eichel. The question is what on the hell are they going to do with their salary cap? And that, I mean, it seems to be a feeling that Alec Martinez is close, but then again, I'm, I'm not sure he is, you know, I mean, he hasn't taken how close can he be if you haven't been on the ice, you know, maybe he's got lingering effects of, of either his previous injury or COVID that we don't know about. It's been very murky, but they may be able to get away with stashing him on IR and this all works itself out. But if they don't, there's a lot of gymnastics to do there, Scott, to get under the salary cap in time. 
Well, <clears throat> there have to be some guys who are pretty nervous <clears throat> in that room because everyone knows the, the, the money in it, right? You know the math. Mm -hmm. You know that Eichel, <clears throat> 10 million comes in. See what, you know, how do you, how do you become cap compliant? And you know yeah. that, I know there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there. They, they all hate the Tampa Bay Lightning. So everyone's a conspiracy theorist except Tampa fans. Especially but, Dunkey I mean, Hamilton, who was so yeah. angry about them being 16 over a million in the salary cap, but then he signs a huge contract. And guess what? If you hadn't want that to be like, yeah, you want everybody to get paid, right? <laughs> it's helping everybody. Anyway. <laughs> but I do, I, I, what I, the thing I remember most about <clears throat> that whole Kucherov situation, you know, the fact that he was able to come back and step right into playoff action like he never missed a beat and this notion that, well, can, can you hide someone? And I remember talking to Bill Daly, deputy commissioner, and, you know, the, the NHL pays attention to these things. They are checking with doctors. So to yeah. your point about Alec Martinez, now, if he's, you know, to me, it's a different, like it, it's maybe the inverse is that is Jack Eichel ready to go now? Well, you, he, you know, the NHL is watching all of that too, right? Because when he's right. ready, they can't just have Jack Eichel practice for another month. No, just because that's not going to fly. You. Right. So I guess my point is the NHL will be watching very closely. When is Jack Eichel? Should he be cleared? When does he start to count against their cap? And then what are the ripple effects? And that yep. includes, well, what is Alec Martinez's health? What is his status? When is his likelihood to return? And your point is he's not on the ice. I mean, that's one thing. But it is going to take some, it's just, there's someone's going to have to go. That's my yeah. sentiment. Um, and, and, and I'm sure that Kelly McCrimmon is now trying to figure out, you know, is it Riley Smith? I know that name's been out there. Um, it's, it, it's the reality, right? Everyone yeah. knew this was coming. So it's going to be fascinating to see how it, how it works because we, we talked about this Pete DeBoer, I thought was great in Vegas at all-star <clears throat> yeah. saying he, you know, Ike was one of the best players on the ice, even though they weren't doing contact. So there's a high level of excitement, but it is going to come at a cost. Um, and we'll see what that cost is going to be moving forward. I, I wanted to ask you though, cause I was curious about that. I was curious about that game because to me, it was a really important game for Edmonton, maybe more so than Vegas. You know, Mike Smith comes back off the IR um, I'm not blaming Mike Smith. You, your team gets shut out. You get two of the best defensive players in the NHL. You got Evander Kane come up with a goose egg. But this Oiler team is not, they're still, I, I don't know what to make of them. And even with Mike Smith back and Koskinen has played not bad. I, like, what do you do? Like, I, I don't well, know. How I mean, that's Miko Koskinen, not bad. Like, that's the problem. Like, he's a serviceable NHL goalie, but not a great one. And with that Oiler team, they need a great goalie. But you know who else needs a great goalie? The Tampa Bay Lightning needed a great goalie. Yeah. And the St. Louis Blues needed a great goalie. And, like, that's what you need at this stage of the game in the NHL. You need a great goaltender to win the Stanley Cup. Like yeah. and we're, I haven't can't remember the last time somebody just kind of like lagged their way through and won one. It just doesn't happen anymore. And that team isn't constructed strong enough, man. Like when they go up against a big team like Vegas, that's pretty strong in their lineup. You just see it. Like you shut them down. You, you take away the middle ice. You pressure McDavid hard, and you stay out of the penalty box. Like that's your key. And, and I mean, even last night, Vegas was in the box three times, and they managed to kill the power play. You can sit on dry idle on the backside. Like it starts to become predictable as the year goes along. And if McDavid's limited to two shots in a game, you're in business. And I think that Edmonton is just, they're just short on just about everything. They're short on depth. They're short on D and they were loose last night. The number of rush chances. I mean, I don't think Mike Smith's, you know, he plays very deep in his net. So he has a chance on side to side movements, but like no goalie is going to, pull them out of what they, they are. That's kind of my point. Like, I mean, even if you got, even if you dropped in 1992 Pat Roy into that net, it, it's not going to change anything right now. They yeah. aren't good enough defensively. They don't work hard enough and smart enough. I don't see enough hockey sense, especially in the neutral zone. Let's teams go the other direction, Scott. So I don't, like I, it's, I, 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 it is, they're such a fascinating team <clears throat> and it's, and now, you know, Winnipeg wins last night, beat 
Minnesota. Vancouver wins again. I think they're a point yeah. back. Now the game's played. I understand all of that. <clears throat> but right now, they the Oilers have to catch Calgary. I don't think anyone catches, you know, so St. Louis is technically now in the first wild card spot. The top, those spots are locked up as far as I'm concerned. So basically you're fighting for one spot, one wild card spot, unless yeah. Anaheim falls yeah. out of the Pacific. So LA, Edmonton, uh, maybe Anaheim in that mix, Dallas. Like really to me, that's who's going to be fighting over that wild card. Yeah. But Vancouver, Winnipeg, San Jose, <clears throat> all still in the mix. And, and, and I guess my point is the Oilers have not, taken any real strides to separate themselves from that group. So it, it's, it's one step up, two steps back. I mean, <clears throat> we watched while we were in Vegas, um, you know, that game against Washington got up to the big lead, blew the lead, mm-hmm. and finally ended up winning, but it, it's, it, it is nothing is easy for that team. And I That's really don't know if you're Ken it. Holland, what do you do? Cause you're not really close. You're just not. No, they're strapped. I mean, they, they could get in. They really could. But that's you just can't ever count out skill like that. But, you know, when's the last time they really went on a run this season that looked like they were dominant for a long stretch? I mean, like even a team like Dallas has had moments where we're like, these guys can be world beaters when they want to be. And that like, like, especially as a player, that gives you hope that, hey, we've won eight in a row before, man. Like we can do this or whatever it may be. And Edmonton, it does. It seems like even if they have two or three good games in a row, they'll just have an absolutely catastrophic one like last night. They yeah. get shut out by the Golden Knights by the backup goaltender. And and <clears throat> listen, that's that's me projecting what the what the outside looks at it as because Laurent Brossois is a really good goaltender and every yeah. goalie is. So that sounded like a bit of goalie hating from me. And I don't want my goalie nerds out there coming after me. All I'm saying is that- That would never happen. The perception, it's like they got shut out by the backup, which- that's bullshit. But um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't see it with them. But I, I still, you can't count that out. You never know. So we've had so many interesting things going on around the league, Scott, <clears throat> that, you know, I, I, to pivot a little bit off of the players in the game, this front office stuff going around the NHL is just mind blowing to me. I mean, of course, last week we found out Pat Verbeek was named general manager of the Anaheim Ducks, which a move. I, I like that. I think it works there, but Chicago now is employing the strangest tactic to hockey that we haven't seen and that they're just saying we've interviewed everybody. Hey, Peter Shirelli, come on down. You're the next contestant for the Chicago Blackhawks GM job. And whatever the guy's name is from the Cubs, who's never been in <laughs> hockey, whatever interview for a position, come on down. You were an intern in 2020 or 2012. Sorry. I don't want to sell them too short, but like, he was a baseball intern in 2012. I was still taking pucks to the collarbone in Peoria, Illinois at that time in my life. You know, who else have they interviewed? Well, oh, Scott Mellenby. Now there's somebody I really like that I think could help that organization, but it's just, it's been a very, a very open um, process there as to who is interviewing for these jobs, but really a, a, a baseball guy, you know, like, listen, I actually think, Scott, somebody coming from another sport could easily slip into a management role in hockey as an assistant and learn the game a bit, learn the nuances of it, and be able to manipulate cap and use analytics. But I think you have to have somebody at the top at this stage who has at least been in the game. They don't have to have played at any level, but you have to understand the nuance. So did it surprise you to see an assistant GM from baseball interviewing for a full on GM job in hockey, you know, not an assistant. Yeah. And I I like that. I like that Chicago's saying, Hey, you know, we've interviewed this person, sort of an NFL thing, I think. And I like that idea that that there is some transparency from an organization that has been short on transparency. That's for sure. But, and you know, it's not a particularly diverse group, though, right? I mean, all the people that they've announced that they've interviewed have been white males, as far as I can tell. So, um, you know, I like the idea that they're telling people what they're doing. It might be nice. If you're casting a net as far as you are and in looking into baseball, I don't know. We've already seen, you know, Emily Cassingay get an assistant GM job in Vancouver and well-earned that it is, I, I don't know. Anyway, 
We'll see what else they come yeah. up with. And I'm with you, Mike. I, I, I think you have to look outside the box. I mean, it's probably a bad example given how it ended for John McDonough in Chicago. Uh, but we, he came across from the Chicago Cubs to the Blackhawks. He really did for a period of time create, you know, the Chicago brand, right? Made it, you know, took yep. him from a laughing stock to one of the most, you know, successful pro sports franchises anywhere. Um, you know, we know that he, what we know that didn't end well for him and that he was partially responsible for the Kyle Beach uh, sexual assault cover up. So, um, but my point being, you have a guy who came from baseball. Um, and, and seamlessly translated to hockey. Uh, I think being a GM is a completely different beast, and I agree with you. It should be a lower management company's going to make that jump. But I applaud, you know, what about, you know, what about European? You know, we, you know, we, That's uh, the untapped market to me. Yeah. yeah. Truly Patrick is. Patrick as, as, as the new GM in Vancouver, knows Jim Rutherford very well. Um, you know, it's, you know, just – Two European GMs, uh, Yarmo Kekalainen in Columbus and Patrick Alvin now in, in yeah. uh, Vancouver. But yeah, there's a whole other world out there. So, um, yeah, but I was I'm, curious. You know, speaking on the, the management side, a couple of old players uh, getting new titles this week. And you mentioned Pat Verbeek in Anaheim, um, Scott Niedermeyer, Hall of Fame defenseman, joining the management team there, and Daniel Briere, whose name has come up you know, with the Montreal job and a number of other jobs. <clears throat> such a smart young man will you know, help out Chuck Fletcher as an assistant in Philly. And hey, listen, Philly's, Philly's a train wreck this year, no question. But I, I do like that they are committing to scouting and development and they're pouring money into those areas. And I think having Daniel Breer with, you know, a real formal title now, I know he had lots of interaction with Chuck in the hockey ops department um, mm -hmm. before, but I think he's, I think both those guys, are super, super smart, and their voice is going to carry a lot of weight, and they are going to bring a lot to the table. I, I wonder what you, you make of that. Yeah, I like the repatriation aspect to it. Obviously, Niedermeyer is one of the best defensemen to ever play, and Danny Breer is passionate, young, still hungry about hockey, yeah. um, and obviously has the ties to Philly. Philly, I can't help but always worry when they bring in more ex-Philly players, though. I, I just That dynamic in that city has been – troublesome, I think, over the past decade, decade and a half. But, uh, and that's for an organization that I absolutely love and want to see succeed. They treated me so well when I was there. And um, I think this is really the right step for Danny Briere. I mean, he's been loosely involved in the management side with Philly. And I think this makes it more formal and gives yep. him, it's going to give him more experience that I can tell, even if it's just in name. Um, it's a good play to have these type of people around and you never know what their aspirations are. You know, for Scott Niedermeyer, maybe he just wants to remain a special advisor. These are, yeah. listen, these are guys that realistically have all the money they need. They can do whatever they want. And these, ad, these advisory roles are kind of laid back when you want them to be or about as intense as you need them to be. And, and that's a good fit for a lot of ex players. You know, not everybody wants to be a general manager. Not everybody has, not everybody's married to the game enough like a Steve Eiserman to, to do this, you know? I mean, you have to love it. You have to be a lifer to want to be a GM. Yeah. Um, those guys bring value to their teams. I like those pickups for both of them for obvious reasons. Um, but I do wonder where it goes for Danny Breer. Does he have, if he's interviewing for GM jobs, clearly there's <coughs> aspirations there. But you always learn from outside influences and I think it's good. And there's been yeah. no shortage of stuff going on around the league in that way too. You know, you just, from assistance to top end, I'm a big believer on experience. You do have to have people that are at least ready for the position. And I wish at this stage of the game that we did have more, you know, viable camp, more women, more people, people that have need to be given an opportunity. Yeah. And that's what we're finally starting to see, but we need more of it too. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> I don't know if I've asked you this before, and if you <clears throat> feel that you don't want to answer, then don't. But has anyone ever approached you? Have you ever has a door at least partially open to you to do some sort of, you know, management? Like I know you've done coaching um, and continue to do coaching, uh, yeah, fulfill that role at different levels. But in terms of management, has anyone ever said, "Hey, Mike, you know, would you want to do this?" Is that 
I kind of wished I'd had that opportunity. <laughs> Nobody's ever reached out to me about that. I think you'd do um, a heck of a job. I, I think you know, you'd be great. I, I, I'm always curious about it because I know we've talked about it previously, but like, I think I definitely get pigeonholed as being a goalie guy. And, you know, it's tough to break out of that, but people also sell goaltenders short and how much we see in front of us. And you want to know how a team's playing defensively, ask a goalie. Uh, and what wins you championships? There you go. So, I mean, would I? Yeah, I, I just, it has to be the right fit if I ever was going to do it. Um, yeah. And I think I would really, really enjoy management more than I would coaching. I want nothing to do with coaching. <laughs> I really don't. Unless, <laughs> like, there's probably one goalie coaching job in this world that if it fell into my lap, I'd take it. And <laughs> people could probably guess, but I also don't expect that to ever happen because, again, you need experience for that. So, um, yeah. I don't know. I think it'd be a fun endeavor for sure. And, and I tell you what, what I don't really envy is going into trade deadline for GMs, figuring out what your team needs, knowing your feet are going to be held to the fire. If you're, if you're Kyle Dubas and you swing and miss on a Felino with a bunch of picks like last season, you know, it just didn't work out with through injury through Nick Felino's play, you know, how much are you willing to give up and shake things up? If you're like Joe Sackick, I mean, with just crazy rumors about trying to bring in Marc-Andre Fleury and scoring and like, that's a really good team in the first place. Do you take a huge swing? I mean, I, I've heard wild things like, you know, three-way trade, send Kemper to Kemper to Edmonton, Mark Andre Fleury to Colorado, and here you go. Like, yeah. is that really going to make your team better with the assets that you may give up to do so while also empowering a team that might be in playoffs like Edmonton? Dude, it's a lot to think about, man. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't envy the stress that GMs face, Scott. Do you think there's life to that, though, with Flurry? Like, really, like Colorado? <clears throat> well, I, I think your point's an excellent. Hey, <clears throat> bringing in a number one goalie at the trade deadline, and we saw this years ago with Ryan Miller coming to St. Louis, where, you know, again, you get sucked into it, and you think, oh, my gosh, now the Blues are going to win a Stanley Cup, and they were done in the first round. And it's not Ryan Miller's fault. But I think sometimes you can overthink it a bit. And you have to really, really identify, I think, the, the, the flaws in your lineup that might prevent you from winning a cup. And I think, you know, Julian Breeze has done such a great job. But I think of the last couple of years of you know, really complimentary players, Zach Bogosian going for the first of the two of the back to back cups, <clears throat> even a guy like Luke Chen, who, you know, spent some time in the minors, but came up and yeah. played a lot during the playoffs. Kevin Shattenkirk. Um, Pat I think Maroon of, on a value contract who, by the way, just signed a two year extension at a million dollars. What a value 10 to 25, you know, 10 goals, 25 points a year. Toughness yeah. can great in the room can help you out. If you need a, something in a PP, like that's a value contract that you can get if you're Tampa Bay. Well, and I think of Barkley Goodrow and Blake Coleman, you know, basically played together on their third line. Um, and Bruce Bach gave up a lot to bring them in. He believed yeah. that that would put the team over the top. Yeah, but you have to, and to me, that's, you know, we spent so much time talking about <clears throat> Claude Giroux and what a great weekend for him in Vegas. And does he go to Chuck Fletcher and say, yes, try and, you know, find a place. If you can find a deal with a contender, I, I you know, I'd be willing to go <clears throat> here or here or here, whatever that conversation is like. If you're Colorado <clears throat> or Minnesota or whoever brings in Claude Giroux, it's not just the cap space at eight plus million dollars a year that you have to assimilate. You have to find a place for him to play. And then what is the ripple effect? When we talked about Jack Eichel, what's the ripple effect of Jack Eichel coming into that lineup? When you knew that was going to happen and you know, you're going to have Jack Eichel for the future, but for a straight rental, like Claude Giroux, like to me that the assets that go out and then the ripple effect on your team, boy, you have to be so sure that it's going to fit because it quite often doesn't. And, you know, Nick Felino, different player than Claude Drew. I get it. But I love that fit in Toronto. And I, I'm a huge Nick Felino fan. But it just did not work, right? Like, it right. wasn't – it just wasn't a great fit. And, and, and so I don't blame Kyle Dubas for making that, you know, for taking a swing at it. But honestly, I think being a GM these days is really – being honest with yourself and not feeling you need to do something to, to just to do something. 
And I think there's a lot of pressure on GMs to do that because of fans and the media and maybe their own dressing. I, I just, yeah. I think that's the hardest job. Yeah. Sometimes you're looking for almost a vote of confidence that you believe in your team that, Hey, we are going to do this, that, and I think there's a, I think some teams honestly make moves at the deadline just to make moves because of that. Just, it's almost for show, which as a player, it's like, why did we have to do that? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I could remember being sitting around even in, you know, in Vegas when they made a couple of moves a couple of years ago, it was like, well, I don't know if they really had to do that. Like even bringing in Nick Cousins, who I think is a great, I think he's a great player. He's been phenomenal in Nashville this year. And I actually Very believe, good. I actually at times believe Vegas could have really used somebody with some sandpaper like Cousins in their lineup. Um, but, you know, he kind of showed up and didn't really do a lot in Vegas. And, and it just, it didn't really fit right off the bat. You know, that's kind of what I thought when they got him. I was like, I'm not really sure how this fits, but I get why you're bringing him in. And that was kind of a, one of those where I'm like, I felt like they just had to make a move, you know, yeah. on top of it to do something to prove to the guy. So sometimes things are optics. Sometimes you got to show that fan base because they're clamoring for it, but sometimes you hit a home run. And like we said, Breezebois sure looked good with those two depth pieces, but if that wouldn't have worked, he would have looked really poor giving up those first round picks for Goudreau and Coleman and uh, you got it by yeah, the guts, man. Yep. True stuff. All right, my friend. Well, it's soon, uh, even though you and I are on, well, you and I are both on central time actually today and it won't yeah. be long because before it's lunchtime, I don't know what you're doing today, but uh, maybe considering a little DoorDash. And as you know, DoorDash is the proud sponsor of the Nation Network of podcasts, restaurants, and more delivered right to your door. And I think this has been a ton of fun. I, you know, again, it's not the same as being with you in person, but no, it was great having the wino on and lots to talk about. It was yeah. Good work by so, you. You know, we can't slap, can't give each other a big high five at the end like we are in person. And we don't have our buddy Tyler Uremchuk with us on this episode. But yep. um, you know what? We accomplished a lot out there. And hopefully now we can look forward to maybe Stanley Cup playoffs or finals and convening once again. And until then, we always have our time on Wednesday, Scott. Do you think, do you think Frank is listening? He went, you know, put, put that bug in his ear. Oh, he better be. This is—I mean, he's the, the the big dog here. Saul Sarah Valley keeps us <laughs> together, man. <laughs> All, All right. right. Till well, next week, Scott. Good work. Till next week, my friend. Good job.